Got a feeling it burns in my chest It's growing larger with every breath I take When I fight it, I hide it, it takes me down Yeah, I know we created a mess It's growing bigger with every choice we make Yeah, we're here, we keep coming around What's up guys, where you been at? I've been waiting for you. My name is Michael Buffington. I'm the concept art lead in the game development department. And in game development, we do really cool stuff. In fact, we teach you guys how to make games. Check this out. As you can see, we got beautiful artwork all over the walls, really high level stuff. Students are doing really good work here. But I got something else to show you. Come on. So down here, we got one of our concept art classrooms and it's full of Wacom Cintiqs. And on these Cintiqs, people do all their 3D and their concept art work. They draw directly on the screen and we have a whole classroom full of them. It's super awesome. Check it out. Hi, welcome. This is Jacqueline Jackson, AKA Jax. She's one of our concept art instructors and she's teaching some really cool stuff in this class. Tell us what you're teaching, Jax. Thanks, Michael. Hi, welcome to GAM 328. This is Monsters versus Mechs. This is an upper level concept design course here at the Academy. In the first half of the course, we create our own Kaiju Pacific Rim style. And in the second half of the course, we concentrate on hard surface design and create our own mech or Jaeger or Gundam to fight our midterm monster. So let's check out some work. Hey, that's Jay, what are you working on? Hey, take a closer look. Yo guys, I got a bunch of cool stuff to show you guys. Come on. So as you can see, everywhere around the department, we have really cool artwork all over the walls. But what I really, really want to show you is our eSports room. I'm coming, I'm coming. This is Michael Witzel, he's our tech lead, and he's the head of all the really cool eSports stuff that we do here in the game development department. Mr. Witzel. Hello, hello, welcome, come on in. You know, the best part about being here is our game lounge. Here, check it out. Pretty cool, right? <clears throat> Hey, David, are you busy? Not for you. So this is David Goodwine. He's the executive director of the game development department. Hi, thank you for coming. How we have things set up here is more about the community. Somebody might have an idea about a game or how they're gonna make it, and then somebody else has another idea. Community, they feed off of one another. So if you guys are interested in making games, if you guys are interested in things like concept art or 3D or game design, programming, scripting, game animation, or anything like that, we'd love to see you here one day in the game development department. Yes, we would. Take care, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye. Let's go. 
go. Apply now at redbullcampusclutch.com. Going back to you
Hi, I'm Mark G, and we're back to do some level design here in Valorant in our ascent map. We're going to be getting to bomb site A today, an exciting milestone. We've been working towards that for three weeks. We're now on week four, and yep, we're going to be talking about bomb site A today, building it out, and hopefully getting into a little more detail, thinking about sight lines, angles uh more of the multiplayer action we'll still go over all the building unreal specialties we need to know as well as just how to be a level designer and uh super excited to touch on a site itself and all of the different intricacies involved with uh small tweaks to level design and how will it will affect a full play out of a uh of a match in esports especially a title as uh mechanically inclined as valorant I think that we're also going to have some uh, some footage of some esports matches on Ascent that we can uh, show off, and uh, hopefully we can talk a little bit about it and why some of the design decisions made towards A site uh, kind of changed or affected the uh, the overall play out of those rounds. Yeah, absolutely. We want to. Uh, we've been working towards this for three weeks now. Um, just a cap what we've been doing for three weeks if you're joining us for the first time we started off by building from the attacking start point area and we really slowly have built out from this broken bridge and have moved our way out towards the attacking bomb site a so it was a slow process we talked a lot about how to build an Unreal, how to use the primitive objects, uh, mostly talking about brushes and static mesh, the brushes being their own uh, tool for Unreal. And if you look at these objects here, this red one, this is a brush that's uh, a subtractive brush. This gray wall here is an additive brush. You can see it's additive because it's solid. And over the last four weeks, we've been slowly piecing this together, measuring every possible angle, every possible uh, combination and measurement that we could come up with based on how Valorant plays. So from here, we left off last week. Uh, week one was really just building out this immediate area. Week two was finishing out this area here and adding more details like the background buildings we've spoken about keeping things modular and that would be the ability to create one object like a barrel here and duplicate it many times over and keep using it for multiple uh, variations and as we built out it was slow going but once we got around this corner we sped things up a little bit and started turning our brushes into solid objects like this so this building here is the exact same building as this here but as you can see the pieces themselves are still intact here and these are brushes so when we take these brushes and combine them all together we can make one solid piece and now this makes life easier for us as we move about and we copy and paste these objects around the world, the level themselves. So it gives us the ability to copy, paste, rotate, uh, scale them, and just feel like we can occupy a large amount of space with just a few objects, which is essentially what you wanna do as a level designer. You wanna make modular pieces that are flexible. They look like something and when I mean look like something, if we just have gray walls everywhere, it could be a struggle. And a struggle is, as you look at everything, you just feel like the, uh, let me mute my other computer here. You just look at gray walls and everything's flat. There's no shadows. So as we're running around shooting and mimicking the complex gameplay of Valorant, it really distracts. You don't feel like you're in a world. You don't feel like you're in a space. You don't feel like you're in a scent, the level. You feel like you're just in this gray box world. 
which works to some degree, but it gets old quick. I think your creativity kind of goes out the window. You start getting a little bit bored. You don't know what to do, what could possibly be the next building, what could be around the corner. By having details and thinking about this being a fishing shack, for example, which is exactly what it is in uh, Ascent, the level, you suddenly start getting more ideas. You start thinking about, oh, I could have a fishing shack here, and what if I added small elements uh, over here that fit that fishing shack? Same with back here. What could be behind my buildings, even though we can't play there? It is nice to feel the space broken up, the light coming through with different shapes. When you see enemies, they're not just standing out on a white wall or a gray wall. So that's the basic reasons as we go about here and we try and emulate the game, but also keep it fairly uh, blocky. You'll hear blocky a lot. And one thing that came up last week is uh, the boxes. We really spent some time making these boxes look and feel correct. We spent time measuring them out. What happens when you're up here? How tall is it? How tall are these two? Putting up our simple little silly enemies here to test things out. But also added a different texture or material. And now we have like a cool blue to it. And I could see right away that just this slight variation of color is a nice addition. So I think through today, I'll probably uh, add another variation of color so we could start moving away from that light gray uh, everywhere feel up to the level. So yeah. this is last week's level. Go ahead. Yeah, like one of the biggest things too about making sure those boxes feel right is because those boxes, like now that we're starting to create these these aspects of you know the game in which players are actually one hundred percent interacting with and going with, um, you know these are are things that will impact gameplay a lot more realistically and a lot more, um, I, I guess, uh, concretely than our other design decisions that we made as far as like pacing for going in the back uh, from spawn, running up to your your a sight lines, you know, hiding up in the corner and, and whatnot. Like these things are all stuff that affect gameplay in like a passive way but when you start to get into boxes and cover and you know places where players are actively able to interact with these are are super super important and this is where our small design changes uh really will start to impact the overall feel of the game as it gets into it yeah so here we have where we left off last week so uh we did a little bit of cheating and i would be me cheat doing some cheating spent about an hour building out this last hall so from our end of our episode we stopped right about here so i went about and added our last i guess we'll call it the hallway uh, we added this last piece and it leads right down here to the cafe the thought being that we wanted to spend this episode getting to dun 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 bomb site a so what we did here is exactly what we've done the first three episodes is a whole lot of copying and pasting, a whole lot of running around in the areas and measuring the distances, uh, checking sight lines with our bad gun and our big red enemies and thinking about does the sight line match up? Can I see the corners and angles appropriately? So the same amount of testing that went into uh, something more complex like the start area also has gone into this singular hallway right here. There are some liberties taken here and those liberties being that I added a extra subtractive brush here to break up the wall. It's really just a random shape trying to get the lighting to have some variances to it. Now as you can see on this wall, I used the uh, slightly cooler texture mixed with the gray and I think it's starting to look a lot better too much white, gray, uh, having the contrast be too close together, I think is a detriment. And you want to think about having some contrast and some uh, play of light in your level to help with the gameplay itself. Having that light there is, uh, it's important when you're testing too. That thing that we always talk about of making sure that you're 
your level is has a feel to it from the early stages all the way up to the end and uh especially given the fact that uh sun kind of gives you a sense of direction yeah i see that you've kind of made it uh almost similar as far as where the light is coming from in regards to the actual level a little bit actually i think that might just be silly luck right now i we haven't done a lighting pass yet and that's a good point to bring up is lighting is uh you, there are people who specifically light levels and light games. That's one position. Uh, do environment artists do it? Absolutely. But there are specialized positions where they just work on the lighting in a game. So we will have an episode where we'll go over lighting and how to change things and add things. Now, the lighting in Unreal is so powerfully good and just amazing. We all take it for granted how good it looks right now with almost no effort. You can see the warning up here. Lighting needs to be rebuilt, 74 unbuilt objects. That's fine for now. We're in development. At some point, though, you're going to have to hit that build light button and figure out uh, where are the errors, where are your U UVs going wrong, and we'll explain UVs later. But you know, you, you're you going to have to uh, spend some time doing that because if the lighting's bad, it just ruins everything. You just can't see properly. There's dark shadows. Uh, there's no ability to play the game uh, and feel like you know accurately if this level is going to be fun and work or not. And I did not change my shooting. It still sounds terrible. <laughs> but the simulation is there as we move about. In the uh, real ascent versus our block out here, as I said before, I measured basically running back and forth between the widths or the spaces here and just counting in my head how much time it takes me to get there, trying to look at what I see in the corner. This corner does this measure up from here to this wall. There's some liberties. I put this post up here just to break up the wall. And when I'm in this corner, where does our arch line up? These stairs. I think these stairs could be a little bit steeper, but we're not going to be a 100% perfect. But this lines up pretty accurately to what you see in the level. We have our cafe back here. And as you see, there's really no detail other than the fishing shack's been transported over here. And this giant building, we'll look at a trick here. This giant building is now sunk into the ground. So we're using our pieces over and over again to quickly block out the level. And we have a little awning here, which looks terrible. Reused our barrel. And here's another little trick. I took our pillars and stacked them on top of each other. So these are the ones we've been using for our walls everywhere, all the way from the beginning starting area. Stacked them on top of each other to create a little bit of a breakup around the edges of the arch. So we don't want all the edges to be perfectly flush with the ground. Uh, in our current Valorant level, a lot of it does hit the ground and it's quite flush. But... Uh, one thing you could do in an environment to really break things up is have foundations, pieces that stick out, not have everything perfectly at a 90 degree where you have that hard contrasting line. So I'm not doing it because Valorant, uh, a lot of it doesn't have that right now, but they'll do things with textures, materials, and lighting to make sure it blends. You know, that's where you put little bits of grass and you put little uh, garbage piles. You know, you try and break up those hard lines. Understandable. Yeah, that's and I mean, that's one of the things we were talking about before, too, with the uh, the whole gelato stand area is that instead of having just a, a dedicated wall that, you know, people can't run back, there's kind of this uh, out of gameplay sense of organic real lifeness that that exists that, you know, in, in a part of the map, which otherwise wouldn't be played in, it, it just kind of breaks it up a little bit and adds to that feeling. So kind of similar yeah, to the little garbage patches that we see. Um, strewn about and i think what's important is that especially as we start getting into a site and uh and whatnot we we start 
to see less and less of that little breakup stuff as we get more into you know where the gameplay is going to be centered yeah so uh it's tough to lay this out and not you know part of a part of us adding details is it just you've got to feel like you're someplace special you have to capture that feeling and it adds to the gameplay even in these early phases uh, and it helps the art team. It helps players just testing. It just feels like you can see things more clearly. It gives you those contrasts. And also, the tough part about this is we've gone in a linear fashion from start, from the start, the attacker start, two bomb side A. But there's alternate routes coming through here, and we haven't even touched those yet. So in the uh, upcoming, we're going to have to start blocking this out. So we've set this up to feel fairly accurate, at least to this wall. And we've touched nothing over here. So trying to get a real playthrough uh, and understand how the teams can interact and work, it's going to take a much longer period because after we think about bomb site A and we build that out today, we're going to start in a second here is there's the process of how do we all approach the different bomb sites from a defensive standpoint as well as an attacking standpoint. So it definitely takes quite a bit of time to block something out, test it, fix it, change it, come up with an inspirational new idea. How do I, you know, how do I make this better? And it is hard to throw things away and keep going. So that's all part of the process, getting used to throwing your work away and trying new things. So that's one advantage of us building from a existing game. We get to, I won't say copy, we're going to say emulate and learn and build from this from a successful map. So we want to build something that's successful, that's been tested. And it does help us when you build this in a slow fashion to see how much work and how much time it took to put all that together. Okay. Uh, and I mean, um, yeah, that that's the whole thing, too, of when you get into the whole uh, idea of level design versus character design and, oh, this is what these agents are capable of doing and how does that affect how they push this sight line? I feel like you've got a little bit more play before the game releases with, you know, um, the, the, the very first maps that come out, uh, what you're able to do with those because you have the ability to change all the existing characters but then when it comes into maps that are added in release and new agents that are added after release, there's a lot of stuff that changes based on how you're able to actually adjust what's already there and, and add new things. It's you have, do you have a lot less freedoms then uh, once that kind of comes through, like you're committing once the actual game releases and, and you've got your agent selection, Versus when you're still making level for the very first time, you're still making all the characters for the very first time, you can kind of add and, and remove things when you're in that testing and building and deleting phase. But yeah, it it is a different mindset. Uh, some people thrive, uh, some designers, uh, developers thrive on that open ended experimental stage. They just love, I could do anything and I'm going to try this, I'm going to try that. Oh, let's throw it away and start over. Uh, and then there's other developers that really like once the rules have been set and they feel like they can start fundamentally laying it out and measuring and understanding what the game's going to be. So it really is up to the personality of the developer uh, or designer. Uh, you know, I put together games, experimental things way back when like the Wii was first coming out. And we had all this like, you could do anything with the Wii and all these crazy <laughs> controls. And for me, that was just like, blah, like I had no interest in that. I wanted to understand the rules, uh, the controls, and let's just make something, you know, with a good story, good gameplay, and just like focus on that. So it definitely depends on the developer for sure, like who wants to thrive in that atmosphere. And you, you have to be ready in those early phases to just all those characters to change. And your level may have been awesome, fun, and the most favorite level in the studio or out in the community for a short period, but because of massive changes, it's all thrown away and starts over. Wow. So it's definitely a different mindset uh, when you're in those experimental phases. 
it's so funny that you mentioned the the Wii and like the motion controls kind of stuff and like oh like this is a new thing but at the same time it's only for that one platform and we're kind of in that right now with uh with VR we're kind of hitting that 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 point where it's like okay so this headset and these controllers have this feature this headset these controllers have this feature um and so it's like cool so when you know, this one tracks all of your fingers individually, uh, which will allow for, you know, this and this and then pressure sensitivity. But then how do you implement any sort of similar feature to controllers and headsets that lack that? Um, and then especially when you get into like esports titles or if you get into competitive multiplayer titles, um, it, it changes a lot as well based on, OK, well, if you want to have a semblance of, of competitiveness and fairness across all platforms, you know, you kind of have to ignore all of these features that, you know, either the hardware company is trying to push or the, whatever new platform is trying to you know, reinvent the wheel, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, that, that is definitely rough with uh, different consoles, different uh, VR, you know, you have the Oculus, you have, PlayStation's VR, you have Xbox VR, you have all these different elements and yeah, trying to adapt it to all the above. And then there's games that allow you to play it in VR as well as not in VR. Uh, and if it's really specialized for VR, that's hard. I mean, it just doesn't adapt very well. I mean, I, I have yet to see a game that plays as well in VR and in regular third or first person. So you just you just really want to take full advantage of what you're working on and what like you said what are the special controls and the movements and everything it's definitely hard and i think uh it really depends on the developer and how you like to work you know some people love that free open expressive period and they just go crazy um i tended to not like that quite as much just because so much work and effort puts into it, you throw so much away. So it was, uh, I definitely thrived more in something where we figured, we had figured things out. When you're coming to characters, I think it's fun to work with characters uh, in the early stages and you can go crazy. But when it comes to levels and missions, a little bit harder. Mm, understandable. So, all right, I see you're, you're building out the floor for a site right now. Yep, we are uh, starting off. So one of my biggest questions about that is when, so a, a site has two levels to the floor. You got the first baseline and then you've got that staircase that, that ups it just a little bit. Um, so you have this somewhat of a sloping feeling um, to go up to it. And especially it, it's like three and a half layers. Cause you've got this base level here, which is um, the exact same height as the A lobby run up, the exact same height as tree run up. Then you get the staircase to get onto the site, and that kind of demarcates where you're able to plant the spike. And then you also have the little half level of it, it, the hell underneath rafters, and then the box staircase to go up onto rafters. But what do you think that there is like any specific reason that they decided to uh, like gameplay wise that they decided to just raise up half of the site uh, rather than keeping it all flat? They absolutely could have kept it all flat, um, but it might have made things a bit weird with this whole rafters situation. And then, you know, rafters still just goes down anyway. And then you have another like half level thing. How do they decide the heights for all of this kind of stuff? Or is that something that just kind of comes after? Well, it's definitely because of this is a competitive shooter. It's, it's all about, you know, giving variance to target sight lines and angles. Like it's just far, t if you're running, uh, if you're running up this slight angle, these stairs, uh, heading towards heaven, the the fact that you're going to go up at an angle takes a lot more skill to line up, let's say, the enemy that's up there on heaven hiding behind the wall, the box. So those variances create visual interest. They create a visual challenge as well. You're not just lining up at head level because you know someone's either crouching or standing and you know exactly where they could be in those two heights are pretty much the same. So I think it's just, it just, it just goes right into the competitive nature of a shooter and how you have to add variance and challenge yet still try and stick to, you know, 
the sight lines, the angles, and thinking of every possible hiding spot. Where do you prepare an ambush? How much of the field of view can I see from different approaching angles, whether it be attacker and defender? I think that just helps change things up uh, quite a bit. Uh, just because, you know, when you get expert players, expert players, one thing, a pro, they're going to master anything at some point. But when you're talking about the bigger casual market, you just don't want everybody to be so good at something because the level itself or the layout is just too simplistic. I see. Yeah, I, I guess if it if there were wasn't any change in height to the whole level, you could just walk around with your uh, your crosshair in the exact same spot. Just just lock the um, pretty much just lock your Y coordinate and then just not worry about it. So. Yeah, you could you could do that in games like um, like Unreal Tournament. You know, that's an old school twitchy game. Uh, you could download that for free as part of Unreal. And that game, uh, when we design levels for that game, you have to you have to create those variances and those height variances because in that game, every weapon is pretty much spot on like a laser. It's just if you lock on straight on and just you could headshot people like crazy. Bam, 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 bam. And you can just take them out like this. So there's constant thoughts of changing the heights, the variances, putting up uh, blocking lines of sight so nobody can get shot. Like a hallway is just a death trap in Unreal Tournament. <laughs> you can just line it up with rocket launchers and boom, 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 boom. Just take out an entire uh, bunch of people. So you do build it into the game and think about that quite a bit. Like, how is this going to change gameplay and enhance it as well? Totally, totally. So I'm building out Unreal Engine or Unreal Tournament. Unreal Tournament is oh, so Unreal yeah, Tournament it's... is very old school twitchy. I just think of old school twitchy games. I just think of Quake right off. Oh yeah. So we're getting started here. So right away, we've measured up from last week. This was all settled in, and we felt like it was fairly accurate. Still need to add props. Still need to add some chairs and tables, which we could dispense throughout the uh, level. feel like this is accurate. Putting out my silly enemies to test things. Moving about, timing this feels really good. Now it's time to do the exact same thing, but heading through our arch here into site a so coming around this corner i need to think how much time does it take to get from here to here takes about two one thousandths to get to that wall how big is this doorway where the uh door locks and then our general slope up would be our next thing. How high is this next area? Yeah. So I'm just that next area starting off right where you've got you made that wall indent there. So at least that that'll make it easier for that sight line. And and I guess that is one of the good things about the geometric nature of Valorant is that when we're recreating the level, we we kind of know exactly where everything starts and stops. Yeah, I can't imagine uh, the testing that goes on. I mean, this is a very um, obviously heavily inspired by CSGO, but it, I mean, it is more simplistic in the way that you can figure out sign line strategies because the maps are smaller. And I'm comparing this to something, let's say, than let's say like Battlefield. And Battlefield isn't uh, a competitive esports uh, title of the same ilk but i can only imagine trying to test that massive maps they have with all the organic shapes and trying to figure out what areas you know too powerful for the attackers or too uh too easy for the attackers or too powerful for defenders to hold the attackers off i mean i just can't even imagine working on something that big and complex yeah and how much they have to go through You've got to kind of focus on your environment artists to, to make sure that everything is is connected. And then it's just like, you know, your your A flag through your E flag and got even a parasail storm when you have to worry about not only islands, but then also 
uh, the actual fights on the islands, the fights between the ships off of the islands. Yeah, that's an entirely different beast. But I think I would probably enjoy something like that myself. Um, I've always been a huge fan of Battlefield. Oh, I I would love to work on something like that. That is definitely a on the wish list I've not accomplished is a massive level or environment like that designing it with something such with a huge scope especially the natural aspects of it i would just love to make something that huge and natural try and capture all the subtleties of it the shapes contours the foliage everything i just think it would be a very fun experience i really think so too especially just uh yeah, all, all the variants of the vehicle warfare, and then you've got the maps that are only infantry, just lots and lots of uh, different things. But so as we get into building a site, I kind of want to talk about um, kind of the, the thought process as a player for why some of these lineups are super, super specific and important, specifically when it comes to like Peeker's advantage, because recently I have come very accustomed to as a Yoru player, getting inside of hell via teleport and then working on like those those shots from there. One of the things that you can do as Yoru is send out a uh, teleport beacon uh, or a fragment and that teleport fragment follows in a straight line from where you throw it out. So when I throw it out in any specific spot, um, it's very important that uh, you know I know where it's going to end up via just it hitting walls and, and walking forward. So I know that it's going to end me right here where I'm in cover versus if I were to throw it out just kind of randomly or even just adjust my aim a little bit. And now suddenly I end up in a completely different spot in the map. Um, there's also Sova arrows, which uh, we've shown off before just while waiting around. We There's also... Um, Cypher utility, which I don't have Cypher unlocked myself, but um, I just never started his contract. But uh, the Cypher utility is also super important with all of these tiny little variations in uh, geometry. It, it, it'll affect where he can place his trap wire and the actual angle that the trap wire ends up going across. But so I just want to just going to talk about all that because as you're building it right now i know that we're going to be taking some liberties with the specific shapes of like the doorways and and all that kind of stuff but um i'm really glad that you've been putting such a big emphasis on making sure that the timings of of where you're running and also the angles of everything stays the same or true to the original just because of how much that does actually affect yeah these the special abilities in valorant uh that adds a huddle you know, and it's one thing to run around with the different weapons and shoot, which is very much uh, CSGO and other shooters. Uh, then we have a lot of the abilities that emulate smoke and emulate uh, the flashbangs from CSGO. But then we go to the next level where, yeah, you're, you know, how laying out big old puddles of flame or lava that the player can't walk through poison walls and capturing those angles where the arrow can ricochet off the wall and target, uh, expose and target enemies around corners. Getting that perfect just takes hundreds of hours of testing and really takes your, it really is up to your testing department as well as the community in general to play it and you just pay attention to the feedback and what's happening uh, as people are playing the game because that is that is a decision to be made and, and monitored constantly. How, you know, is this exploitive? Is it too easy to do this? Will people just master this skill set and be able to, uh, you know, one character becomes too powerful versus it takes skill to do that? So I'm measuring everything out as usual. So we're following through what we've done since uh, episode one. We are trying to measure everything out. Uh, I'm going to go back into Valorant here in a second, but right now I'm just using screenshots. Keep looking at my other screen. There's a seven stairs here. there, by the way. So this is just paying it. I took extensive screenshots 
especially of site A. Some of the others were a little bit easier to take screenshots of and just I could immediately figure out how to build it. This was a little tougher because there is so many, as already said, there's so many angles and thought put into what do I see looking through this door? Because this is the game. Defend this site. Attack this site. How can we defend it? How can we plant the bomb and then hold this position? So I've tried to take every possible angle from all over the different possibilities. I didn't stray too far because we would be building forever. We have behind the boxes, behind the generator, on the side of the generator. We have here under heaven. I have different characters trying it out. We, I played jet to get up on these high points and look down. So there's just an enormous amount of screenshots I took trying to make sure I can get this right. This saves me time as well instead of constantly going into Valorant playing. I still have to play it. I still have to play it in Unreal a lot. But if I'm going between Valorant and Unreal, I think it could slow you down a little bit. It's good to have something still like this to really just look. Like, this shot's great. You can see so much. And you can even measure in your head what's happening here. You know, the stairs, the angles. Heaven's up here. You have the, uh, the two boxes here uh, covering up under heaven. Even the layout of this is important. You know, where can we hide behind these brick piles what do we see from this side one speaking of like since we're talking about all of that um metric right now so if you look at a site the uh that upper portion is uh the whole texture of the ground is tiles and i wonder if this was like an intentional thing for the design of of ascent to just kind of look at, at this tile flooring here, this kind of like grid. And if oh, that had, yeah. do you, you think that was 100% intentional? Just be like, here's a grid that we could cheat to look at to figure out. Well, it's, it is a natural boxes. process that uh, there's a lot of grids and tiles in uh, built out areas. You see dirt. We have dirt here in other areas as well outside of the bomb site. But yeah, it's uh, when you're building, you're using tiles and you're looking at, which we've been doing, we go up here to our top down view. We have our built-in grid from our Unreal, and we can measure and snap using our snaps up here to different areas. So, yeah, you're constantly using the grid to measure uh, how much you snap and make everything exactly perfect to the grid is a little bit flexible. I think it can help with some certain skill types when you're talking about jumps and how high things are you know that the player can't just single jump up to an area or they need a perfect double jump uh, to get to an area. That's when metrics and the grid really come in. Um, but yes, even when creating after you've done all that and they start texturing, it's definitely, it, it could fit right into the theme as well as helping the design of the level itself. So I'm just going to measure this out and just get our slope in we need a little bit of a banister here and i'm going to cheat and use our modular piece right here so these are stacked on top of each other like i showed earlier one two three to give us some variation i'm going to copy this and i'm simply going to put it at the edge like it is in the game itself uh, and i need a better uh, screenshot you see, yeah, you can use that kind of, uh, yeah, that is rather similar. So just kind of make it a bit bigger. And I have so many screenshots, I have to cycle through them now. I was so <laughs> impressed with all my screenshots. It takes forever to get through them. So we have one at the top. Now we're going to have to check the height of this, but I'm just going to put this in for now anyway. And then I'll adjust the height and the slope. So let's just get this loosely put in and we'll grab the same thing copy paste it now professionally i usually i think i probably would have a little more detail in here uh, just because i get bored looking at the same windows and the same doors um i've always just kind of built more detail because i really enjoy it and it just makes 
everything go faster, smoother. I get more, I have more creativity. So I will spruce it up at some point and probably add a few more props, a few more of this, but we'll make an episode of that too. Like, hey, how can we break this wall up? How can we do this? We won't ignore the fact that there's still more of that to be done. What we really want to do is get to A and talk about how this is all coming together. So let's measure this out. So I'm not going to be able to run up that. Oh, I am. Look at that. Whee! So I thought for sure I'd get stuck there. But the uh, threshold of allowing me to go over a step or curb is pretty forgiving and unreal right now, my character. So that's perfect. So let's do a quick, I'm going to jump back into Val right now and do some measurements. And I'm cheating. <laughs> I'm flying. That's okay. Boosh. All right. So I know this is accurate. Measure this beforehand. And if I line up, I'm right at the edge of the stair. If I go over here, almost the exact same. So grid-like, it's perfect. And if I run straight ahead, I just clip the edge of this. So now I'm going to count. Make sure I'm at the beginning. It takes me about four seconds to get to this. These stairs are, I wonder if they're the same as what's over here by our little restaurante with the little stuffed animals. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. A little bit, a little bit uh, more. Eight steps there versus seven over here. Well, actually, it looks like one less. It's hard to tell the angle from here, but angle's pretty darn close. The, the sloping of the stairs. Although yeah, I the guess slope. That That's a better better term, the slope. I guess that for uh, this little cubby here, it doesn't matter too, too much, just given that it doesn't Oops. connect anywhere else. And I mean, I know we always talk about exactly how important all these angles are, but... Um, when it comes to one-off areas like this, the player is just going to have to react. And this, uh, the the placement of wine here is more as a as a different sight line to uh, either push in deeply as a defender or as something else to uh, kind of surprise to defend your spike plant as an attacker. Um, but I believe that the those stairs there are kind of of the same level of importance as the stairs that we have right over here in that it's just a way to adjust the sight line perfectly and not a way to, uh, you know, fully change the, the game plan, what's possible, like what we see on uh, these stairs specifically on the site. Um, you know, the, the stairs on the site, uh, changing the angle and changing the, you know, the rate at which that, whole section of the of the site is adjusted will affect your gameplay and will affect how things are played versus popping out looking at a wine and that's more of a reactive and just kind of organically where the player's head is going to be i am just lining up this a little better i i uh, took some liberties and put these in here so it looks better Breaks up the walls, the lot, the lighting, but they're sticking out too much. So I'm going to have to pull them in a little bit. Now we get a better measurement to where the stair is. Aha, perfect. And now we need probably this one to be a little bit shorter. Go to my adjustments here. So these, these stairs are, again, brushes. They can be adjusted. So I can adjust the width a little bit. I'm going to now put this same little, I don't know what we're calling this, we'll call it a banister right here and try and measure it up. It's too far over. Pull it over. Now I'll go into the Unreal and measure this up for sure.
I'll hand type that in. And now let's play it really quick. Feels pretty good. Looks yeah. a little different than the camera. It's kind of I think crazy the stairs could be just a little bit farther back. So one, one thousand, two, one thousand, three, one thousand, four. Well, it's pretty close. It looks pretty close. It looks pretty close from what I can see here. I think it only just looks farther back just because there's more stuff behind them. And since I measured this up already, I can just copy paste it over. And this should be nice and accurate. All right. So now we just get our, get our friendly little slope in here, which I think um, I'll just put a silly uh, box, box, box in and cut it up. I better uh, to look how far over that goes. So the depth of this area, not very deep. It looks like we have one, we have the double box highs, two deep. So hopefully that metric is exactly the same. Yeah, these are the same boxes and we don't have to worry about that too much. It's uh, six boxes total, creating a little L shape there for uh, our mobility agents to be able to utilize. But for agents like Breach and Yoru who can't jump, kind of stuck on the ground floor over here. So we spent a lot of time talking about boxes last episode and it seemed a little ridiculous, but taking the time to measure everything and test and test and measure and test and test. Uh, it's just like uh, building anything in real life, woodworking, whatever you're whatever. doing, you measure twice, cut once, uh, same principle. You just got to measure and test from all different angles. Uh, if you mess up one area, you get lazy and you don't test it and play it and go back and forth and count how far it is or look at the grid and count the, count the inches or centimeters or meters and make sure things line up, you're going to regret it later because moving an entire wall, once we have this built out, is going to affect this entire area back here. It's going to affect, you know, how wide this is. It's going to affect this area here. So it just, it just piles up on top of each other if you don't check things over and over. So these are too deep. And then I'll grab these two. And these. We have a building back there. So let's get a wall back there. This roof is really sticking out. We'll just leave that for now. And I'm just going to reuse this big long building. And I'll bring the awning with me just for fun. And some of those, the awning right now just looks like a throw-in, but later on when we get into the lighting the lighting episode, that's going to add a lot more detail than you think. We'll see cast shadows and things like that that will actually uh, really enhance the level quite a bit. I didn't realize that lighting was actually like one person's job. I didn't realize that you uh, have, some like, people tired some studios dedicated to it. Yeah, some studios have the environment artists do it. And it depends on the, the game. But when you're talking like a triple A game, there's definitely a lighting person uh, working on lighting. And they're they're working with the technical artists on shaders and just the general behavior of the lights, uh, but also getting in there and actually, you know, adjusting things, making it better, talking to the environment art team about what they can do to enhance the lighting or help it. it it's a big task. You know, think about Battlefield and everything that goes on in there or like a triple a game like tomb raider and all their specialized areas oh yeah levels so i'm just gonna grab this single face move it back because it's really bugging me that it's sticking out this much it kind of looks funny i'm gonna have to fix that after all right, so I'm going to leave that for now. So let me just measure this. Let's go back to Valorant. 
So from here, oh, it's really close, huh? I can't get up there. I need to turn myself into jet. I guess I can fly. Yeah, these are the same box sizes as all of our other... I guess we can call these like one use, one unit boxes. Yeah, just like the uh, cardboard box that we have uh, underneath that wall there, the regular one U box over on this side with the half size, or I guess the the uh, one eighth size, and then uh, same with our first light boxes. They're all the same size overall, which is good for uniformity and uh, player reactivity. Yeah, I know that you can get over to these boxes with a, a character that doesn't have any mobility. The the first light box is sitting in the middle of the site, but I know that you cannot get pretty much uh, anywhere else. I think that you can get on top of the generator if you are a skilled enough bunny hopper. But as far as getting into the... Um, yeah, so I can get up to, to the generator here. But as far as getting up to those four, I believe that it is impossible if you are a uh, if you are a character without mobility. All right, so this well, look how we started off the blank space, but already look how good this looks. It's all like, hey, this is bombsite A. That's so like this cool. already comes together and we're just I recognize it like, oh, yeah, this is good. And when I run around the space already feels pretty accurate scale wise. Uh, I'm going to put this little slope in here and we'll show you an, a quick trick, uh, which I don't think I've done. With the brushes quite yet. So the brushes are our tool we use in Unreal and they're under. When you have your place actors tab open, they're under geometry. So they allow you to edit. It's it's not, it's a little more specialized than using uh, geometry and mesh in uh, Maya, where you get in there and work with the extruding and beveling edges and things of that nature. Uh, it's a little more specialized, and I would even say clunky and buggy at times. But I think the primitive nature is to our advantage. We can't get too crazy. We can't spend a lot of time modeling and try and make it high poly, which is a good thing. So I'm just going to grab a material. Uh, let's put, I'm going to grab this warm gray, which is, you can see it looks white. All you have to do is add a tiny bit of color, which changes things quite a bit. So we'll grab this warm gray. I'm going to grab a box, drag it in. Now we've shown the editing mode before you go into modes and you go to brush editing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to slice it a couple times, and I'm just going to make it a little more organic shape like that grass knoll. I guess I could make it green because it's supposed to be green. So how we do that is we select an edge. And there's really no secret to grabbing an edge. You just keep clicking till it happens. <laughs> and we split it. And then we'll split this one too just for Shit. fun. It, it might be good to have a... Uh... A green brush given that there is some greenery on this map that we haven't gotten to yet I guess that would be a go. brush that's a mesh isn't it or could you remind me the difference between those so the brushes is there are there formal tools that we can build like this we can actually edit points and do some of the things you do in blender you do in ZBrush, you do in Maya or 3D Max. You can actually edit the geometry and extrude faces. So it's a very, it's Unreal's version of geometry editing. Now, a static mesh, you usually import it from, uh, from like say Maya. It comes in solid. So what we did is we combined our buildings over here into a singular static mesh. So this building right here, which has one, two, three, all these brushes stacked together. When I selected all those, I turned it into this singular object here. I see, I see, okay. So now Got it's a it. solid object. It doesn't hog our processing power where uh, a brush is constantly having to be updated as you move it about. It's constantly processing every tick. It's like update, 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 update. So if you have hundreds 
of these in your level, it slows things down quite a bit is another issue. And if you have a lot of overlapping, it can cause some weird issues. So you have to be very modular. You have to be very disciplined about it. And before I crash and lose everything, I'm going to do save all. <laughs> so the rule of game development is... Uh, I hear a lot of people say, I'm so unlucky. Everything always crashes. No, you're just making a game. That's called game development. Things crash constantly. So something to get used to. So I'm going to make this a little bigger. Now where... I need to look at my screenshots here. I don't know where the grass ends. Uh, it actually ends uh, right as you get to that large block uh, right there. And I think that... The wall? The... Oh, it, oh, it ends before it a little bit. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think that... That's that, probably one of those that... liberties we probably wouldn't have to worry about. Because I don't... You don't go up or down on that or anything, right? You do, actually. Yeah, this this uh, whole area here, as soon as the grass starts and then you peek out from this wall, your character's uh, Y starts to change. and Oh, so... you immediately go up. Good one. Yeah, so that you can actually make the jump over up here without having to crouch. Because if I don't crouch jump, I, I kind of hit the tip of it. But if I crouch jump, perfect. But then up here, ah. as soon as I get onto this uh, green, I don't have to crouch jump anymore, and I can see that. That's the fine details of uh, you know, who made that decision? Do we do we purposely leave it, leave it there? It just happened happened to get in there. And it just remained because it looks good. It looks good that there's a transition from grass to concrete with a little beveled edge there. You can see the little edge. So that's one of those things of like who made the conscious decision or was it just just accidentally put in for visuals? So I need to get this slope in here so it slopes down a little bit. Go back to uh, my lit view. I have to reposition it a little bit to compare with my screenshot. Cycling through my hundreds of screenshots here. Cycle through. Whoops, I think I got the wrong one. There we go. So that's that side. That's that side. There's quite a bit of big lift. Do you have to jump up on that wall from the grass where you were before? Um, you can you can crouch it. You can crouch jump it to get up on that wall from not on the grass. But uh, when you're like so from back here, and that's a combination of the distance and the height. But if I crouch jump, it doesn't shake my camera at all. If I do regular jump, I. I have an impact and I, and I bounce on it a little bit. So that grass, um, you still do have to jump up at the left-hand edge and even on the right-hand edge, you do have to jump up. But another one of the important things is that if I send my Yoru teleport here, this is why I picked Yoru right now. So sending this teleport orb, it gets stuck on this wall from there. But if I send it right here, um, it still gets stuck. I send it from on uh, top of that ledge it doesn't get stuck so this is where like the, these little things of this ledge here uh, uh. I even when I'm walking I don't have to jump up over here when I'm walking I do have to jump up and Very that, cool. those little things of Yoru teleport it goes over where I don't have to jump over here because I have to jump, to jump. can't do it so the reason that that's important is because it prevents a few different things from happening. And now I'm not sure if they knew that Yoru's abilities were going to be doing this when they were making this level because this level goes back five years now. Um, but if I send Yoru's teleport out this way, it'll hit that wall, it'll bounce up, and it'll, uh, it'll go fully up and I can get into that corner. I cannot do the same thing if I'm trying to send my teleport over from Y. Now, what I can do is I can angle it this way to go up the staircase and make it on the right hand side of that generator but i have zero angles in which i can make it to the left hand side of the generator without peeking out because if i go that way it'll just hit the wall and i get stuck if now i do have the the ability to if i peek out i can get it to this side a little bit and then i might be able to jump it if i get it completely right 
But even if I j don't manage to do that, if I get right here, let's see, that will get up. Okay, so I can make it over that way, but that lineup is immensely harder because of the fact that I have to now peek out this way and reveal myself to the sight line. I can't just send this in a way that would work fully. It's, it's yeah, very, and again, is it uh, did someone test that like crazy, or is that just a happy circumstance? You know, I'm sure I'm sure there's cases of all the above where you absolutely have things tested and uh, levels adjusted and character abilities adjusted, uh, and other times, you know, it's added a nice complexity to it or diversity and added a little bit more of a challenge. We would have to get the expert in here to make sure uh, what truly happened there. So I'm going to add a tiny bit of variation of color here. So okay, now I'm just fully dedicated break. to figuring out exactly how I can get this lineup for my next comp match. <laughs> oh, this is how you get good at a competitive game. You figure out every little angle and edge you can find. So I'm going to replace this material with this greenish material. And now I'm going to copy paste it over here. Ah, Oops, that's not working because I'm still in geometry mode. I have to compare this to... Oh, I just roll right up that. Wee, wee. So there's a problem. Is uh, my I don't actually have to jump on that one. Yeah, the right hand side you don't have to, but the left hand side you do. Yeah, so I may so. have to change that a little bit, but visually it looks pretty good. I have to change that visual a little bit. That area is sticking up. I could probably add a little bit of a visual border. So I don't want to sit there and tweak so many minor details that I'm missing the point of, you know, developing a level and a mission. So there's always this give and take when we go level design, how much detail you add, how much, you know, when do you stop uh, adjusting things and just get into the fact of that's good enough. Just leave that edge. Uh, it takes a lot of back and I think forth. I think that you um, you might have the stairs a little bit too long. If you want to like, go ahead and check out what my screen looks like over here with the scent, the way that the grass and the wall line up. So this, uh, oh, a little bit of artifacting. Uh, so this wall oh. lines up perfectly with this uh, this beveled edge there. And so that is where the stairs end. Oh, yeah. Right on top of that. Oh, this is and too so big this right here. Inlet here, yeah. So it's kind of like this inlet and this wall mark exactly where the that next. Yeah, we've got starts. a little bad measurement here. So it's the best way to adjust. So I'm probably just gonna slide this forward and see how this feels first. Whoops, let me turn that off. So keep comparing. We want to keep comparing, keep comparing, keep testing. You can definitely get in a rhythm of, I just want to build, I want to make it pretty, and you can definitely get yourself in trouble really quick with that. So it's more like this, right? Whoa, what happened to my grass? So the grass one? lines up with the edge of the door as well. I think that almost there ah uh, this is all off well i could adjust this so now this is all off so this needs to line up so the grass could easily be adjusted we could uh we could rein that in a little bit let's see if scaling the stairs works
And this is exactly what you do for a lot of hours every day as a level designer. A whole lot of building and testing and adjusting and scaling and playing and playing and then going to meetings and testing and figuring out your next step, getting your teammates. That looks better. See how the stairs still work. Ah, still works pretty good. Don't get stuck. So my threshold for going up these these uh, little walls is pretty high in Unreal. It's definitely not as... But that's something that can be adjusted in, in the actual Unreal. Yeah, I would actually have to character go into the player character level and adjust design. it. going to leave uh, as you can see the same building was just brought over again how many times have we used that building I did make a new wall here didn't reuse the building obviously because I had to make unique uh, this arch and tunnel through same with this area but this is the same window I've used over and over you can see them right here so these are the same boxes we tested and made sure the scale and size was accurate last episode and we're reusing them right here. We know these are accurate because throughout the game they're reusing the same sizes. So now I'm going to put a floor above this. I should probably bring this floor in because it's way too big and it's going to cause problems later. Let's just be smart. You don't want it depends on the tools you're using. Having a lot of overlapping mesh and extra pieces hanging around gets messy. You know, there's definitely times where it's okay to do that, uh, but you have to be aware there's definitely could be consequences later. So let's get our floor in here. And how big are our two glowing dice boxes there in the middle? They are one unit boxes, just like the other boxes that we have. Oh boy. Let's grab these two. And are they perfectly side by side or? No, they are actually a little bit um, staggered. And so I don't know what the actual metric is for them to be staggered. I'm not that great with math, but I believe oh, it should I see be it. one. It's not one fourth, is it? Actually, yeah, it might be. It is one fourth that they're uh, they're staggered. So, so let me line up to what you're looking at here. So you're looking here. I guess it's more like here. Like here. And that is also important because of peaking. So these are farther back. Peaking and once again abilities. Time to jump. Let's jump in here, see where they're lined up. So from our entrance here, we go straight through just at the edge of the stairs. Oh, we run right into this edge of this box. There's a good measurement. Oh, you're right. Yeah. Bam. Yeah. And it's inset ever so slightly. Not a whole lot. It's you're a, definitely yeah, so not one, It's one fourth of the whole box. And uh, actually here, if you want to um, set up behind it for me, um, I can show you the the exact amount that you are hidden. So if you fully squeeze in there, it's exactly half of your player model. 
So it, it is important in that you can still actually see, I, like I can yeah, see I you see a you. lot better than you can see me. So if we look at yeah. this perfect lineup right here, this is a really, really important part of peeking. So you are not hidden, but you cannot see me from there. And so the reason that that's important is because as the attacker trying to find a, a safe spot to plant the spike, you are in a disadvantage to uh, a defender that is baked into the site quite well here, especially if I'm sitting here behind generator and you don't properly check that angle when when I, you come in to plant the spike, you can just peek out and see me. Well, wow, it looks like you could you. see me from this angle. Interesting. Yeah, and yeah, so that's I'm completely a whole hidden. left versus right peeker's advantage. Um, and so super, super crazy to, to kind of think about that, but that's why um, you always have to wonder what angle your your enemies are going to be pushing from, because if they're pushing from the right hand side, uh, you know you have an advantage versus if they're pushing from the left hand side, and that just all has to do with sight lines and the way that this game specifically decides to go for it. Uh, I think that in Warzone it's actually the opposite. Um, and also uh, that's somewhat balanced by the fact that the gun is is on the right hand side, so it kind of you can see more on your left versus the right but in reality you really want to focus on what's happening in the center of your screen anyway but those situations aren't where most of the gameplay falls in line you know it's mostly the 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 taps for headshots and whatnot but it is still a very important aspect of competitive first person shooters is to to know where your peaker's advantage is yeah, that's that's a great example right there. Because when I'm looking at you, I would assume you could see me. I could see your head peeking out. Yeah, cannot see you at all. You want to do a, a fly up over there and check out the generator? Let's see what that shape and size looks like. Is so, that two box the same? Uh, so no generator this this is actually a unique shape here uh it is a, a rectangle with um uh, and this will be important in a second it's a rectangle with sloped edges on the top but yep. um it's a bit thinner than your your standard boxes and uh, it's a lot longer uh, so but it definitely doesn't measure up and if you go top and we see it compared to the other two glowing box dice there Yeah, and uh, once again, like with the uh, the whole tiles thing too, we can kind of use these tiles as a nice metric to figure out. Um, it, it's kind of like a built-in grid for this site. Oh, it is really a built-in grid. Have. Yep. I believe that the generator actually lines up with a couple of tiles. Yeah, almost, Al almost fully lines up here with these tiles. so you can see the boxes they are not lined up with tiles but you can at least use that to give a sense of size looks like just smaller than nine by nine and there are three by three i mean Oops. and coming over to this uh a little bit smaller than three long and then about one two three four five six seven eight uh, a little bit shorter than nine long But one of the important parts of that, of this uh, this generator, is that little sloped edge on the side here. So can come up to it, we see that this box has, uh, has a nice little ramp. And this is honestly one of the harder bunny hops um, that is useful in casual play. But if you can get it right on the first or second try, as it fit, oh, I actually got it right there, I just walked off. But uh, if you can get it right, it will allow you to get a very unique angle onto the a lobby run up as a defender and yeah basically if that slope was not there you would have to have a mobility character to get on there such as jet but um since that slope exists and i love that as soon as i'm trying to point it out i can't make that jump but here we go um once you actually make that jump here, you know, you, you notice that you only barely make it just because of that slope. Um, this slope allows you to get up here and, uh, well, you're not going to be fully safe because obviously there are zero forms of safety, 
Uh, but, you know, someone peeking out from that side isn't really going to have the, the sense to peek there first, especially as they swing out and they look over this way, they look over in hell, they're checking on this double box, they're checking on L, but as they peek out to the left, you're gonna be the first thing they see up here, which is very different from the sight line of where you're standing right now, or maybe behind the generator, stuff like that. So this is a big advantage, especially if they have already seen that Jet is maybe over here, and so they take out Jet, and they're like, cool, oh, I don't have to worry about anybody being up here. And then suddenly you have a, uh, suddenly you have a, uh, well, uh, an angle that they were not expecting. What is the uh, height of that? It's a little bit higher than the double high boxes. Uh, it is just a little bit higher than double high boxes. So I'll go double high and then, okay, let me see if I can get this. Okay, double high. Yeah, a uh, little bit. A little bit shorter than double high. Oh, it is. Very, very slightly shorter. So I'm have to do, having to do some silly edits here. So to make this little slope in, I'm going to have to grab an edge or two points. Yeah, and then uh, another thing to, to talk about in relation to that generator here is um, just these lineups with, um, I guess, the two most, Im the three most important characters when talking about that. Because you can also talk about, like, Molly's, and you can talk about, like, the Fireball from Phoenix, and, you know, um, talk about Breach's Blast Pack. You can talk about um, uh, Brimstone's Molly, or... Um, the, the most important ones, in my opinion, would be Cypher for his trap wires and exactly where you can set those trap wires. Um, you have the uh, Sova recon darts and the lineups with his shock darts as well. And so the recon darts are important because that's all based on sight lines and where a shock dart will or where a recon dart can land and what it can see. Um, and then you've got Yoru, who has basically all every one of his abilities is reliant on how uh, straight lines are affected. So we're, I know we're talking about a site right now, but I'll show you one of my favorite lineups with Yoru, and um, especially as a defender or as an attacker, what you can do. So if you come over to B site here, um, the site line over on mid link towards the back alley, if you line it up just right, not that I've practiced this a lot or anything, but you can send this out and it will walk all the way down. And just because of the way that his teleport works, it's following a standard W key press. And so you can actually send that teleport all the way back into the defender spawn. And it goes all the way back into the corner, which is important for that teleport sound. So as long as nobody is holding in mid and they can't see that come through, you have a really nice sight line to uh, just kind of walk up it. And so, you can employ that same tactic over on a site with Yoru's abilities um, in the sense that if you have a Viper wall or a Phoenix wall uh, or enough flashes, you can actually send his teleport from this side all the way over to walk up the stairs past those first light boxes and uh, send that teleport into hell. And then they don't see it come up if you wall it off correctly or smoke it off correctly. And then boom, now you're on the site and they weren't ready for it. Same with what we were talking about before. As long as you can afford to cross over the doorway and make it over to wine, back yourself up into this corner, potentially. You just have to hit the sight line really, really hard uh, to kind of walk it up and go back behind generator. And then, boom, you can teleport out and make it onto the site. And granted, that doesn't mean that you're going to get any free kills, but, you know, enemies will only have a half a second to react to that sound cue before changing where they're looking. Um, I think that I think that it's really important to just keep all the, the sight lines and hard angles and geometry in mind, especially when talking about, um, you know, a competitive shooter just because of the fact that it's all going to be about where their crosshair is and how quickly they're able to change that. Yes, it's uh, much, 
more, you know, based on centimeters and pixels and, uh, you know, you're testing every little tiny little bit of the level. And I can only imagine how many hundreds of hours goes into that, figuring out what's going to work. So I'm trying to match this up and there's something wrong that this seems really tight right now that compared is to our tight. game. I think that, um, oddly enough, I think that these tiles are really going to be our best friend. Uh, it looks like they're yep. th it's three tiles long. These boxes are just under three tiles. So I believe we're going to want to use like one and a half of our 1U boxes. If, yeah, we'll call one of these boxes just 1U. And uh, so this thing here, for example, this is 2U tall. This is 2U, 1U. And then this is about obviously. two and a half wide, these boxes here. Yeah, I'd say that this space about here is... close to three. I'd say this space here is, is one and a half boxes three. long. And this is this is almost the same width, just a little bit thinner than these. And then yeah, from this it's one, two, three. It's almost four, three and a half. So let's go back and compare that. And if we have a common unit and you're like, wait, we need to make a grid and we need to do this, and yes, that can be done. But since we have a common unit here to measure from, and that is this box or these boxes, we've already measured these extensively. So let's compare it. These are close to three. That is, this is actually accurate. The part that's off is the gap here. So this needs to be more like over here and even farther so over here so go to top down view just move that back so this is almost snapped right on top of that box if we were to give it one more unit and make it four which is close to what i said about three and three quarters i think this is a little bit closer so let's hit play Oh, got to get rid of that box first. So one of the things I'm trying to do right now is figure out, as a defender, trying to push up further into wine. Now, I don't know in a competitive sense why you would do this, given that you don't know what the cross will look like, unless you flash out right there specifically um, while your teleport is crossing. But you could utilize that kind of wall up here but you can really see how precise these angles actually are because when we were first going in from the whole wine thing, I was just like, okay, it's just, you know, a little bit this way and a little bit that way. But it's actually pretty precise. And you can tell based on how these corners are lining up with in relation to where I'm at on the site. So right next to this generator, if I walk a perfect line from the generator onto here, I see these corners into uh, wine line up fully. And so that means that if I'm anywhere back behind, I have no way to get in. I have to peek specifically past this generator in order to get into, um, in order to see in between this whole corner here. So this corner is our like, this the specific angle right here is our metric. And if I want to see inside of that, I have to be out past the generator. And so Peeker's advantage in this case goes out to the attackers trying to get onto the site because they are going to be able to see you a lot sooner than you can see them. So I have to p push out past this generator in order to see into there. And I can actually just put my, uh, my little teleport here, right here, I'll be our person peeking the site. And so if I want to take that person out, I cannot see them until I go past the generator, which at that point 
reveals me to uh, anyone else that would be already deeper onto this site here or maybe out that way. And so these sight lines are very, very well defined. I'm uh, mimicking as you talk, explain, and play. And this surprise, after we adjusted this and I checked this link, this is pretty accurate. There's another thing that's come up that's really bothering me and it just reinforces what we've been talking about is I'm looking out here through the arch and we're looking towards wine. And as I move forward, like you were saying, attackers have an advantage here. I can't really tell like where that wall ends and begins, mainly because of lighting. Uh, and we'll adjust that later. But it's also, it could help right away if I had more geometric definition there, some architectural shapes. So I'm looking at gray on gray here. And it just is bothersome. I'm shooting over there. I can't tell. Like, would someone be peeking around the corner? I can't see the corner. So this is a perfect example of why you need to build shapes in here early on. Because I just can't see this wall meeting this wall meeting this. I can't tell this corner right now. So it would be good to, uh, you know, do we have a variance of color? And you notice my colors are very simple. Um, doing the Crayola crayon color test does not work in the level <laughs> design. It highly distracting your eyes dart all over the place it takes a lot of work to blend all these beautiful textures they have here in ascent they have that blue wall they have a brick color they have a gray they have a brown they have a warmer color lots of colors going on but they take a lot of time so it doesn't distract you know the grass is not just blaringly green grabbing your eye there is that caught that turquoise building you just raced by out in the distance which is quite bright and shiny Definitely. So, interesting to see the comparison here because it, it feels like we're getting pretty close to this accuracy. And again, one thing we brought up that's a, a little bit of an issue is uh, our characters aren't tuned the same, our shooting's not tuned the same, and our field of view is not tuned the same. So, having the camera match everything perfectly while running, shooting, uh, is a little bit of an issue. I still feel like we're getting pretty close, though. That was, a, that was an excellent comparison on how the smallest defined areas, built out areas, affect the gameplay so drastically. So what I have right here, I'm feeling pretty confident about. The only, the only thing is this box. How big is this box, the uh, double high? Yep, exactly. Is it the same width? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, uh, so if we use these, uh, these our standard box sizes here is one unit. That, that, that box is two, yeah. Same with up it's here. It's the exact Just same a different texture, texture and it has me fooled. Yeah, same with this box up here, actually. Two units, uh, same exact texture as the one down at the bottom. So as we continue on that wall, get my better reference here, which would involve my still shots. So as we move up here, we're going to have the half box, the main box that gets you up to heaven. We have another double box, which is the exact same as this. We've got to think about this space here before we get to the heaven platform. How high is heaven? So that's uh, it's definitely a double box there and a half box. And then how much higher is that? So we already have the that measurement set because of this here. I believe would match that. Yep, that that's our one unit box. We're basing everything else off of. Oh yeah, actually, you're entirely right. That uh, that small box there, it's the same, isn't it? Yeah. Wow. And then just a mirror. modular modular metrics modular <laughs> metrics. Love that. It's such a boring boring term. Modular metrics. You need to come up with something better. Go. Lots of, uh, I mean, and obviously we're set in a, what's the word? We're set in an architectural landscape. So I'm just going to duplicate this again, simplify everything, but I'm going to lower it because it's lower than this one. Think about the distance here. How does it line up to our little dice? So 
So four grid tiles over is where this box shows up. This is actually flush against the wall, which I got wrong. Let me jump back into Unreal here. And I better do another save. Save often. I should have more levels saved out because levels get corrupted just like everything else in a computer. So that's closer to that. Pull that out a little bit. And we said it was four over. So let's turn on our snaps. So do you have a term for these specific lineups where um, I really don't know how to phrase this, but so specifically when talking about this wall, um, you walk up to this two unit box up here and I walk this way, right? If I send my teleport forward, it exactly hits up with this one. And then when I'm right here and I do the same thing, it, it exactly lines up over this way rather than like a hallway it's it's perfectly executed to the point to where you know a hallway you know if this was just one player size over to the right i could walk in and be perfectly in between them whereas these are set up to where i'm next to it i walk up and i'm perfectly in there is that like a th i really don't know how else to describe that other than like the opposite of a hallway but what do you what do you think? Huh. yeah i'm trying to think uh i don't think of the, i can't think of a specific term but it's very much i mean just probably just changing the gameplay so you have to actually adjust your player path and navigate more a lot of that is very 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 subtle in level design you know i will state things like oh it's too straight you're just going down 90 degree hallways too much um, and it just feels like you're constantly hallway, boxy room, turn the corner 40, you know, 90 degrees again. You try and break that up so you don't feel like you're on a grid. You don't want to be on a, uh, an old school D&D grid drawn dungeon. You want to feel like, you know, things are randomly placed, even though for the most part, this level really is set up on a grid and very much, you know, set up with everything being very boxy and angular. So that that's my best description is to get it off the grid to make it feel like the player has to adjust their sight lines, move about. There's nothing worse than being in a game and you just hold, I held straight and I walked and I opened a door and I walked through the room and there's the door right in front of me. And I opened the next door. Like we see that in earlier games or poorly designed games. You know, even if it is a building or an area that's very like it's hallways and boxy rooms, it's a classroom. You could still make a classroom or an office have the desk in the way and there's a round desk and there's a raised platform and there's a couple steps there. It's very subtle things, but the player's navigating and feeling like they're in control of this space. That's a little, that's a little bit like that. Um, you don't want everything to be perfectly lined up. In, in the wise words of cloud nines, uh, CSGO team, just W key forehead. <laughs> yeah, just W. There you go. Just W. So I am going to let's see the height of heaven. How high does it go above that our one unit box? So we're back into it now. Is it a single box higher or less? Um, which with the uh, oh for heaven. So I'm going from the box to heaven. So it it is about um, it's just a little bit higher than our half high box, our one eighth unit. Um, but it's still jump upable. Without a camera shake if you crouch, and with a camera shake if you don't crouch. So hard visually without a grid to really measure it. It is half. 
Yeah, it actually, I think it's a little bit less it's, than uh, a full. Yeah, and so the the way that I th that I like to use it as a metric is the jump and and camera shake. So when I jump up on on our one eighth unit, right, that little box that you're adjusting there, I jump up on it. Um, if I hit the jump correctly, I don't have a camera shake. If I and I don't need to crouch jump for that. Versus even if I hit the jump correctly on the jump up to heaven, I have a camera shake. If I crouch jump, that eliminates that camera shake because it uh, adjusts the height of the player. But that is a good metric to, to utilize, and that's how I know that this is not the same height as our 1 8 unit, is because of that camera shake. Nice. So the camera shake is one of the... You'll In other games, you see... Uh, I'm trying to think what it's called, where they uh, you catch an edge and they pull up. Uh, Doom uses it really well, and Real Tournament uses it really well, where you catch, you jump, catch, and there's a quick hitch that you bump. You know, you caught yourself at the edge and mm -hmm. uh, continued on. And then they, if you're a little bit farther off, it slows you down and you huh, boost yourself up even more, but slower. Uh, which I think in Doom is uh, done to perfection. Oh, absolutely. Uh, Doom is one of the best first-person platformers out there. Dying Light, also a really good one. Yes, that's something I have not played, and people keep trying to get me to play. Dying Light 2 coming out this year. <laughs> oh, I missed out on one. Jumping into two. You still got time. So let's break... No, should we break the rules? Yeah, we're going to break the rules in... Should we just use cubes? Now yeah, we're just gonna use cubes. Speed things up a little bit. So we've almost got heaven up. A little bit slower than I wanted, but we're close. Actually, you know what? Let's just use the full power of the brushes and just no, let's not. That's going to be a bad idea. I'm going to regret that in further episodes if I do that. Let's just put this here, get in our top-down view. I'll change the texture so we can't tell. Now that I'm obsessed with Yodu lineups, I'm wondering if there's a way to get around that box there. I'm just discovering more and more about these sight lines and these lineups, and I really just do not know how much is is intentional and how much is just lucky byproduct. I'm sending my my Yodu teleport fragment out, and I'm just seeing. Let's see, so the Yodu teleport fragment has this weird thing of friction as well. Um, and I really just wonder, so the, the friction thing, right? Instead of being regular with just holding W like your player, if you're holding W for long enough in a straight line, you will slow down and the teleport fragment will actually eventually stop. And so that prevents you from kind of overextending your lineups. So I'm really wondering if I'll be able to send this. Not that this is a, even a useful teleport, just given that you have no idea what's going to be on the other side. But I'm really addicted to just seeing how these, how these fully interface with each other here. Okay, so this is the angle, and I can lock in my angle by just lifting up my mouse, and we'll see if I can hit that same angle and have it still cross the wall. Okay, we're gonna... and you're the you're the tester game player that drives us all crazy with <laughs> testing these crazy theories out. We're like, no, stop breaking it. Just leave it alone. It works great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've never been part of a long term development multiplayer where uh, you're thinking competitive and you're having you know a giant open community constantly testing like this and going back and forth and uh, perfecting it. The micromanaging and the small decisions far beyond, you know, the single player game where you're testing against a very singular gameplay tactic. Yes, people can break it. Yes, they can do strange things. But uh, in a multiplayer setting, it's so different, especially the competitive end. So, yeah, I've, I have yet to experience that much scrutiny 
and long term. I'll call it long term chaos of all the mic you know micromanagement and changes that go on. I think we're gonna have to uh, leave it at this. I've hopped up. Wow, that actually feels a lot like hopping up on onto heaven. Look at that. Oh, that feels so good. Nice. That's awesome. But there's no hallway. Ah. Uh, should have known it would have taken a little longer. Oh, wait. Do I have an extra box here? Where'd that box come from? I think I scaled something wrong here. Oops. Oh, it's just an extra for measurement. Okay. There we go. All right. I think we are in need of a summary of everything we did today. Lots of talk of gameplay and angles and specialization and questions about how we handle uh, these variances. I think we had more challenges, a little bit more challenge, I think, to put this together accurately. It felt a little bit, a bit more like the starting spot, where the starting spot was a little bit longer and deliberate. And I do believe that that's because this is the bomb site. And like already pointed out, was a bunch of awesome examples of just thinking about, especially over here in Generator, how this angle needs to be perfect. Who has the advantage, the defender, the attacker? When we're over here, who has the advantage, the attacker, the defender? What you see when you're behind this box, who could see who first? Uh, all the measurements we did in the past and perfecting our scale with boxes whether it be the full unit box or the half unit paid off as we now don't have to measure again. Uh, the measurements in the grass took far longer than I anticipated. We had to really think about how this works uh, and how it all lined up. Uh, we used brushes in a little more of a specialized way to create a little bit of an organic shape here. And this is kind of the limits of brush management. If you want to make an organic ground shape, this is what you do. To make this look prettier, I could I could duplicate this and make a little ledge here. But this is about as far as you want to go for organic shapes. You just kind of want to bend and twist and put some pieces together. You don't want to get too, uh, you don't want to think you're in ZBrush or Maya when it comes to the brushes. But we yeah. have reached bomb site A. I'm, and I'm super happy about it. We, uh, I, I really just like seeing how we progressed from the very first episode of just when we started building that out and then yeah the, the modularity of it you kind of did all of this with just pieces that we already had existing and god that really does look just like a site and we've we've kind of figured out almost perfectly what the sight lines are what the run-ups are i think that the only big differences are with the way that the character is handled in your version of uh unreal i know that we haven't done any tweaks to the default character default shooting but that will, and also um, what another huge thing with Valorant is the fixed FOV. Um, and that fixed FOV is, um, that fixed FOV is huge for um, the competitive shooter aspect of it, just because of the fact that it, it dedicates these sight lines to where not a single person will have uh, an advantage, you know, other than what is intended. The, the peeker's advantage left to right is intentional and it is designed for especially when you have um both teams playing six rounds uh or 12 rounds on each half and and you know when it gets up to the the individual players not nobody can just set a setting to to have an advantage you can't just set 120 uh fov have that advantage so it's it's really really cool to see that we're, we're creating those same sight lines and those same uh little intricacies and I, I, I think we've done a really great job here and it was so cool to watch you build up that level i'm excited to see what more we can we can come up with yeah the challenge going forward we'll definitely finish site a next episode because it's just too important we can't skip over that i skipped over this uh this area here over to wine because i felt like it was a quick copy paste and it was uh, it still has importance when you're thinking about the measurements, the angles and everything. But this is so much more complicated in the considerations of attacker, defender and every possibility that exists here with the different characters and their abilities. So as we move out of this, 
probably after next episode, we're really going to start thinking about, geez, how can we backtrack? How many different pathways are there to get behind the attacker or defender, get to the site that's currently uh, the bomb is planted on? So we'll, we'll uh, go into a whole other complicated series of questions and problems to be solved uh, as we move out, because this level is far from complete now that we're on episode four. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm, yeah, I'm excited to get into uh, heaven and then out to the defender spawn. And then uh, once we get out there, it'll be a little bit interesting when we go from mid to, to a site as well, because that is going to be really reliant on if we got all of our measurements correct for a site and for the attacker spawn making sure that everything still lines up when we go from the mid to tree push when we go from the heaven push everything like that super super interesting yeah let's hope uh let's hope we don't get to that point and have a disaster and we'll just cheat <laughs> we're at a park in the middle with the a playground <laughs> to fill the space <laughs> exactly and uh once again just big shout out to uh red bull for sponsoring up you know, uh, the spring Red Bull partnered up with Riot Games to bring you the Red Bull Campus Clutch, the world's biggest university balance tournament to college campuses nationwide. Red Bull Campus Clutch is offering teams from more than 50 countries the opportunity to compete against players from all over the world for a chance to win monetary prizes and more. For more information, check out redbull.com slash campus clutch to register now before it's too late. Uh, qualifiers are already underway for lots of schools. Just this last weekend, we had the Academy of Art qualifiers, which was very, very fun. You guys can check out the VOD on this channel if you are interested. And uh, yes, it was super, super fun. This Saturday, we're also going to be doing Oregon State University and Anchorage. So uh, go ahead and uh, follow and uh, check it out for that coming up this Saturday. And uh, yeah, thank you guys so much. And thank you to Academy of Art University for having me and for uh, providing this. And I'm super looking forward to seeing you again next week, Mark. Yeah, another great week, Artie. Thanks so much. And we'll see you all next week.